my name is Stefan Zeiger. I work at TypeSafe in Switzerland. And I'm here to talk about database access with Slick. I've been here for uh, two and a half days now. And the guys uh, from Wix organized some great tours for me and for Eugene. And we saw some really ancient sites here in Israel. So I thought I'd uh, show you some really ancient site too. This is what a day at the Wix office looked in 1970. And there were many cool things in the 70s that were invented then. For example, relational databases. Maybe that's not one of the coolest, but uh, still, there are other cool things. But for example, you're still using Unix today, probably. That was invented in the 70s. But you're running it on your MacBook. And you're probably still listening to Dark Side of the Moon, but on your iPod. So when you're writing database code for the relational databases from the 70s, why should you still write that in SQL? And that's where the idea for Slick comes in. We write SQL so you don't have to. So instead of writing your SQL code directly or writing JPQL or a complicated criteria API for Hibernate, you just write the kind of code that you know that you're always writing, the Scala code. So if you look at this, for example, it's a very simple for comprehension. You've all written code like that in Scala. And it kind of looks like an SQL statement. It's just a bit of a different syntax, but semantically it is exactly the same as this. So what Slick does is it takes your Scala code and turns it into the select statement. And it turns out that this approach scales very well. Here you can see a more complicated example. It's using a couple of methods from the collections API and for strings, for example. At least they look like you're calling them on collections and strings, but uh, they are implemented by Slick and they turn into this code that you see below. This was actually generated by Slick. It's not 100% ideal, but it's certainly equivalent to the above. OK, so first of all, what is Slick? Slick is a Scala language integrated connection kit. It's a database query and access library for Scala that we developed at TypeSafe and EPFL. Previously, I was working on my own project called Scala Query, and Slick is the successor of that. The API that you're going to use is still the same as in Scala Query in a lot of places, but the internals have changed pretty much over the years. And of course, it's open source. You can use it under the very permissive BSD license. And you might expect now that Slick is an ORM, an object relational mapping tool. That is something we're trying to avoid. Slick tries to do something we like to call functional relational mapping. So instead of trying to bridge the gap between the object model and the database model, what we're doing is to bring the database model into Scala so you can work with that directly. That means we don't try to fight the relational model, we embrace it. And that leads to no impedance mismatch, or at least a much lower impedance mismatch. There are still some differences when it comes to the types, for example. You have unbounded strings in Scala, well, practically unbounded. You have limited sizes in databases, but that's usually not a big issue in practice. It also means you get composable queries. So when you write a method that operates on a collection or a function that operates on a collection, you can just use the existing collection methods in Scala and build new methods from them that work on any kind of collection of your data. And you can do the same thing in Slick. You can just compose database code, which is much harder to do in SQL because it's not very well suited for composition. You also get explicit control over statement execution. That's one of the big problems when it comes to ORMs that um, they're doing things behind the scenes. You might get some data structure that you think is in your JVM, but it's actually lazily loaded on demand. And the ORM cannot really know when to load a specific object ahead, because it's all imperative code. It doesn't know what parts of your object model you're going to need. So it will just load it on demand. This does not happen with Slick. You always tell Slick explicitly when to execute a statement. So you can be sure that it never hits the database without you knowing that. And along with that comes the statelessness. There is no 
client-side cache of any object model that you're updating and writing back to the database, uh, it's always explicit. So you get some immutable data structure back and you write some immutable data structure into the database. If you want, you can map it to something mutable in between for your application model, but uh, still for Slick, uh, it's always an explicit operation. So if you look at the list of the supported databases, it's pretty much the common, common set of relational databases that we support at the moment. There's all the open source ones uh, that people are using. And we also have a commercial add-on package that is supported by TypeSafe with support, proper commercial support. That's for Oracle, DB2, and SQL Server. <coughs> and all the other ones you see on the left side, they're part of the main slick package and they're open source. Let's look at the architecture of Slick. There are a couple of uh, components there. The one that you're going to use most often is probably the lifted embedding. That is the standard query API, the one that was already present in uh, Scala query. We also, have, I'm going to show an example of uh, how this looks a bit later. We also have what we call the direct embedding, which is based on Scala macros and it takes regular Scala code using regular Scala types and just does its magic in the macros to translate that to Slick. This is an experimental part that we're still working on. It's not fully featured, but it uh, gives you a glimpse of uh, the future, where we want to go with that. Eventually, we want to unify these two embeddings and make them fully interoperable, but we're not quite there yet. We also have plain SQL queries when you, in some exceptional cases, when you run to write SQL code, there's a, some special functions that we're not supporting, or you really want a high performance code that you cannot get with Slick, then you can write plain SQL, but uh, it's much simpler than using JDBC directly. Below all that, there's a common session management layer, so you're using the same kind of session management for all these query APIs, and brand new in Slick 2.0 is the schema model that is used for reverse engineering database schemas and then creating Scala code from it. Let's look at the part that you see first when you're writing slick code, that is the session management. You see here a typical scaffolding for accessing the database. There's a simple import in the slick drivers which will give you everything you need to work with the lifted embedding and everything you need to work, need in order to connect to the database in the first place. So it's just uh, one import that you have to do. And then you create a database object. In the most simple case, it's for URL. Just give it a JDBC URL and specify a driver. There are other options when you're running inside a container some JEE container or a play application, you're using for name or for data source and just give it a data source object directly or a JNDI name that it will look up to resolve a data source. And this is something you always want to do in a production application. Slick really relies on a, on a data connection pool below it and you also have to be sure to turn on the pooling for prepared statements. Slick always uses them but it doesn't cache them itself. So for uh, simple applications, just use for URL, for unit tests, for example, but in practice, when you're running in production, you want a proper data pool, a, a connection pool below it. And then you just say db with session, and you pass it a block that takes a session object and then does whatever it needs to do with this session. The session is just a wrapper for a JDBC connection, basically. You also have transactions in there, and there are a couple of other ways of managing this. You can get an explicit session and manage its life cycle, but this is the most simplest version here. You see that I marked this session implicit. There's a re very good reason for that. Whenever Slick needs a session in its API to connect to the database, it's passed as an implicit parameter. So if you want, you can completely hide this stuff under the covers. You just make your session implicit and Slick will use it automatically. If you're not quite sure when Slick will use the session, and I mean, that's one of the major points of using Slick to know when you use the session, you just leave out the implicit here and you pass the object explicitly. So you actually have to write the session passing in your Scala code. But this is completely up to you how you want to design your application. So one thing that many people wonder at this point, 
is we're importing directly from the H2 driver here. So what do you do if you want to support different databases at runtime? How do you write your code? But this is actually not a problem. We're not writing Java here. In Java, you can only import static stuff at the top level. But in Scala, you can import from any stable identifier. So you can do something like this. You have a class or a trait or whatever that gets a driver of type JDBC profile in this case. And then you just import from that. And you can parameterize this and instantiate it with whatever slick driver you want to use. There are two uh, examples that we're providing in the Slick Examples project. That's MultiDB example and MultiDB cake example. These are two slightly different architectures that show you how to do this. And they're both using uh, patterns like that. Now, uh, in Slick 1.0, the profiles were still pretty limited. We've expanded this a bit in uh, Slick 2. There is, of course, the JDBC profile that's implemented by all the current drivers. And you can safely import just from that. There's no driver at the moment that offers something in addition to what the JDBC profile specifies. Then one layer above, we have the SQL profile. That still requires a SQL database, but uh, it doesn't go through JDBC. So this is something you would use if you wanted to write a driver for SQLite on Android, for example. One step higher, there's the relational profile which does not even require any textual query language. So it still uses the relational model, but uh, you'd never see the actual query language behind it. It's a bit limited in the operators and uh, the types it supports. And this is, for example, what you would use for query scheduling. Query scheduling, when we want to combine data from different databases in Slick, which is also one of the new features in Slick 2.0. So let's move on to lifted embedding. Before we can work with the data in the database, we have to define the tables for Slick. I mean, it's all statically checked by the Scala compiler, so we need some class definition to give it the proper types for that. And if you've used Slick before, you will notice that this has changed. This is a very recent change that made it into the last milestone of Slick 2.0 that we're currently working on you now have to define both a class and a value. So the class just takes this tag that you pass on. That's just a boilerplate you have to write. And the class represents the table row, basically. That's the structure of your table. You give it your table name, suppliers in this case, and then you just have defs, which call column of whatever data type for the individual columns. You can pass additional parameters, like here we're saying this is the primary key column, and we want the database to auto-increment that so we don't have to specify the values ourselves. And you also need a star projection. That's what you get, basically, when you say select star from table in SQL. And this is the equivalent you have to write for every table. Unlike in SQL, this does not actually have to match exactly the columns of the table. You can use whatever you want there. In this case, we're, we're using the real thing, just a tuple of ID, name, and city of the three columns. And you also see the type of this table matches the star projection. And then we create a table query object. This represents the actual instance of the table in the database. You can see this as a sort of mutable collection that you're working with. This is a convenience method implemented by a macro. So there's not much to write here. Now, what you may want to do instead is use your own class in Scala for the table. You see, in the previous example, we were using a tuple. So whenever you query the database for an instance of that table, what you get is this tuple three of, I think it is int, string, and string. This is not very descriptive. It depends on the kind of application you're writing. If you're writing an analytics application where you have lots of tables that you query over and you have complex joins between them and just extract single columns from all the individual tables, then it does not really make sense to map this to some custom class on the Scala side because you're never going to see an instance of that. You'll just get whatever data you want. But if you write a CRUD application, where you have the standard create, read, update, delete uh, operations to do on data, then this is a very useful abstraction to build. 
So what we're doing here is we're defining a case class that just uh, encapsulates the data. And now we can parameterize the table instead with this case class. And we have a special operator. It's one of the few operator symbols, custom operator symbols that we define in Slick. This is used uh, to create this mapping. It's just a bi-directional mapping between the original tuple and this case class. So supplier.tupled is automatically provided by Scala when you write a case class and supplier.unapply also. You can write any Scala function there, but if you use a case class, then it gets very simple and almost symmetric because Scala already creates most of the boilerplate for you. There's a similar concept if you want to have your own data type for an individual column. For example, where you might want to do this is the identity column. We've, we've just used an int here, which is probably not a good idea in practice. It's more like a long or a UUID that you want to use. But still, if you have a dozen tables in your database model and they all use the same int or long, then it's very easy to confuse these and try to resolve a foreign key relationship into a wrong table. And what we do in Scala to prevent these errors is to introduce a custom type. And in Scala 2.10, you can extend any val to uh, get a value type. So there is zero overhead or almost zero overhead for this at runtime. It just gets erased by the compiler to an int, but uh, you still get the type safety. So a supplier ID is different from some other kind of ID and the, comp and the compiler will complain when you try to mix them up. And so we're using this for our case class here, the supplier ID, and we're also using it for the column. There's just one thing we need to do to make this work in Slick. We give it an implicit, an implicit column type. And again, there's a helper method to make this really simple. It's again a bidirectional mapping. We're mapping from supplier ID to int, and we're doing this, we're going from supplier ID to int by getting the ID, and we're going from int to supplier ID by just constructing a new object. Again, you can, use to, you can map to whatever kind of data structure you want. This is just the simplest case. Let's look at a different table. By the way, we're using the, uh, a slightly trimmed down version of the standard Sun or now Oracle JDBC data structures here. This is a, a standard example that models a, a coffee shop using coffees and suppliers. So here we have the data for the coffees and you can see there's a foreign key in here. We have a supplier ID. Of course, it's a column of type supplier ID again that links to, to the other table. That's the foreign key. And then we're making this known to Slick by just writing a def that calls foreign key. We give it a name and here we're saying the supplier ID here maps to ID in table suppliers. This will do two things for you. One is when you create this uh, schema in the database, Slick will automatically create a proper foreign key there, so the database will enforce the consistency. And as we will see in a moment, you can also use this in your queries to navigate this foreign key. Now that we have the tables, we just need to get some data in there and define them. So there's a method called DDL that you can call on the tables. It's actually an extension method. This is uh, one of the things that trips up many people when they use Slick. It's a bit hard to find out where to look for these methods because most of them are added through an implicit conversion as extension methods. And this is also the case here. There, there are extension methods called DDL which give you the data description language, basically the schema description that you can push into the database. And you can combine them with a the standard plus plus operator, which is very useful if, you're, if you have foreign key relationships, because then you need to define this stuff in the right order in the database. You can even have circular dependencies between the tables. Slick will resolve that automatically and do everything in the right order. Now we just say create. And of course, this will take an implicit session. And it will create that schema in the database. And then we see all the code for inserting here. I don't really have to explain that in detail to you because it is exactly the same code you would have written when you had a, if you had a mutable collection in Scala. So if these suppliers and coffees objects were mutable Scala collections, you could use exactly this code to insert your data there. Well, except 
Maybe you notice something missing here. We are still cheating a bit. These are the primary keys and we're just assuming we have them at this point. But that's not actually what we said in the schema definition. We want the database to create these primary keys for us and then get them back. So let's see what would we do about this in Scala collections. Well, there's a similar concept we can use here. We can use a projection. So if we want to insert into suppliers, we just define this projection. We're calling it ins for inserting here. And it just maps suppliers to a tuple of the supplier name and the supplier city. So we could just insert this name and city here. Of course, if you do that with Scala collections, this would be valid code, but it doesn't do what you expect. This ins will be a completely new collection which is not related to suppliers. And then when you're adding something to ins, it does not affect suppliers in any way. You can do the same thing with Slick and it will affect suppliers. What you write here is just a query, a simple projection, which still refers to the original table. So if you insert into this projection, you will affect the real data in the database. Now there's just one step missing. We need to get these IDs here back so we can, can use them below. And for that, there's a clause called, a method called returning, which tells this insert to return some data from the database. So now you get the values back and you can use them here. This works also when you're using the plus plus equals, then you get a collection of the IDs back. If you don't do this uh, returning, you'll just get the count of rows that you inserted like you would in a SQL. So now we have our data in the database. Let's get to the most interesting part. How do we query the database? Well, again, it looks pretty much like what you would do on Scala collections. It's not exactly the model you would have used here. What we want to get here is a list of all coffees which have a price less than nine. And we want to get the coffee name and the supplier name. Now, if you did that in Scala, you would probably have c.supplier just be a supplier object. What we have instead here is the foreign key. You can essentially view that as a list of suppliers which always contains a single element. So we do a flat map in Scala. We just introduce another generator here in the, in the for comprehension. In the database, this is a, an implicit inner join. It's exactly the same concept. And this just gives us a query. This does not go to the database yet. You always have to say dot run in order to actually execute this and get the data back. So, why does this work? Well, let's look at the types here. This is not a standard uh, Scala collections code that you're writing. The coffees object is of type table query of coffees. That's a specialized form of a query of coffees. So you get a coffees, a coffees object out of this, of course. And c.price now is a column of double, not a double. So that means when you're calling this method here, it is not the actual less than method defined on double. We're just uh, using the same uh, operator here as an extension method because it has the same meaning. So you can write this code. So it resolves this as column extension methods uh, dot less than. And the right side is expected to be another column. So this constant value will be lifted into a const column. Then you have the suppliers query, the foreign key, which will give you a suppliers object. Note the S here. This is the server side version, basically. This is the table object that we're getting, the row. This is not the client side supplier object. And of course, this is a tuple of a column of string and a column of string, not just a tuple of a string and a string. So that makes this thing a query of a column of string and a, a tuple of a column of string and a column of string. That's just this type which goes here. And there's a second type in the query. That is the type which is computed from the first one and that's the type you see at the client side. If you have returned just a table here, that would be the type of the table or of the star projection. And if you have anything else, it takes the type on the left side and just erases these column type constructors. So the tuple of column of string and column of string turns into a tuple of string and string. And now when you call dot run, you pass an implicit session and you get back a seek 
of this type of tuple of string and string. And that's how this works behind the scenes. That's the magic behind the query language in Slick. There's a question. Uh, why did not we see uh, the run or something like that in the previous like deal? Oh, when you when you do an insert, yeah, this this is actually an interesting question because we've debating debating this a lot. The insert operations are at the same level as run, basically. So they execute the code. We were thinking about changing the design to also stage these operations. So you'd have to say dot run. So far we decided against it because it's uh, not very intuitive. It is a lot, it would be a logical design to do it that way, but when you insert, you often don't expect a value back. So it's very easy to forget that you have to say dot run. This cannot work, cannot happen when you write a query because you always care about the value. So this is much easier for the user. But uh, we're working on the direct embedding and there's a new one called shadow embedding which is based on a research project at EPFL where we're considering doing it that way and we might eventually uh, move to that model also for the lifted embedding. So far we are not quite sure yet which is better. So you have seen before that we have this less than operator that we're just uh, imitating and providing our own method. There's one caveat here. There are two standard operators in Scala that we cannot change. And these are the double equals and the unequals. Because these are defined on Scala any ref or any even. So there's no way to override them to mean what we want. It will always resolve the basic ones. And the worst thing here is if you wrote the wrong version, we cannot catch that at compile time. And this is something to really watch for. You always need the triple equals and the equals unequals here. So always just add a, another equal sign in front when you're writing this for slick. This is one of the very few differences you have to look out for. In other cases, we're really trying to get closer and closer to the collections API. Let's look at this uh, more complicated query. It's not, not really complicated in the slick sense because, again, you would have written exactly the same thing for Scala collections. Of course, there's a group by which is always ugly in Scala collections. And there is a research project, a, actually a Google Summer of Code project currently going on at EPFL to bring comprehensive comprehensions to Scala. This is a feature that was added to Haskell in the latest Haskell standard. And that would allow you to basically just add a line that says something like then group by s.id instead of this complicated stuff. So this would uh, simplify the syntax very much, both for Slick and for Scala collections. But this is the current state of the art for Scala collections. So what you get out of group by is uh, it's a tuple, we don't care about the first part here. The second part is just the group. So in Scala, this would be a list of something. Of course, in Slick, it is, again, a query of something. And it is a query of a tuple of coffees and suppliers. So what we're doing here is we're trying to get the name, which is always the same one, out of this list. And uh, since it's, we don't care which one, we just say, give us the one with the lowest ASCII value, basically. The first one in the alphabetical sorting. Doesn't matter, we could get the last one. But uh, there's an interesting question here. What happens if this group is empty in general? It doesn't happen in a group by, but you can aggregate over a raw table or over some filtering of a table and you could get an empty query here and you aggregate over it. So what SQL does in this case is to give you null when you don't have data. And of course we don't want null values in Scala. They are really ugly and we don't want them in our API. Please take my word for this and don't search for null in the slick source code. There's far too much of that going on. But sometimes you want it for efficiency reasons, but in a nice API, you shouldn't expose it to the user. So what this min instead will give us is a column of option of string. That's the same thing Scala would do here. You use an option type, and that's how we represent nullable columns in Slick. You can use these option types when you define a table. 
you can have a column of type option of string and then Slick will automatically tell the database in the schema definition to make this nullable. And when you have a non-option type, Slick will always tell the database to make it non-nullable. So you can never accidentally insert a null value where you're not supposed to do that. Okay, so much for the lifted embedding. There's one other part I'd like to show you, that's the plain SQL queries. I, I know many people like the lifted embedding because it uh, allows them to write Scala code, but there are also quite a number of people who like to write their own SQL code. They're just not happy with the API provided by JDBC, and I cannot fault them for that, because if you look at this, it is really hideous. The amount of code you have to write to execute this simple single query up here. We just have one parameter and we want a list of two values out of that. And this code is not even 100% correct. If you want to get uh, the error handling right, you add, need to add a couple of additional lines here because we're, we're just doing finally close, which might throw another exception, then we're swallowing the wrong one, so the real version would be too small to read from behind there. Instead, when you do that in Slick, it looks like this. There's a very cool feature in Scala 2.10, which is string interpolation, and we can use it for plain SQL queries. So you just pretend you're doing string interpolation here, but this is actually safe. So this is not like string interpolation, just adding this value in here and uh, then getting uh, lots of security holds because a user might write some malicious code there. The query you get for the database is exactly the same. You get a question mark there. Slick turns this uh, pattern that you're inserting as a variable into a bind variable for the database. So this is completely safe. And then you just tell it what type you want back and you say dot list to give you a list of the results. And again, it takes the implicit session here. And in our own API that we're writing here, this person's matching mode method, we're also making it implicit so it will just work seamlessly. Can I have a question? Yes. So could you go back to the slide? Is it possible to infer that we need to have ints and strings there? No, we have no idea what this type will be because we're just writing plain SQL at this point. In theory, it is possible, of course, by connecting to the database and having that checked. Uh, well, actually, we, we have just written a definition of our table, right? So can we no. somehow relate this query to our table? This, this is completely unrelated to the lifted embedding. Oh, okay. So this is really just plain SQL code. And that, that is kind of the point of it, so that we do not have to, have to intertwine this with the Scala definitions. So this will just go to the database. But it is possible in theory and in practice, as shown by other Scala projects, to do this. You can have this checked at compile time by the database. This is not yet supported by Slick, but I hope we can work on the required macro APIs to make this work really nicely in the future. And we need your help for that, Eugene. <laughs> we need the caching API, and then this should require just a few lines of code in Slick. And I'm pretty sure we can do it. Yes, there's another question. Uh, is it possible to, as with the Yes, you can do that. The, the syntax is slightly different. The concepts are a bit different there. And I'd like to unify them in the future, because I'm not really happy with uh, doing this. But there are also implicits involved. The way it knows how to build a tuple of int and string is by inferring an implicit. It's a type called get result. And similarly, when you have a parameter here, there's a type called uh, set parameter that you have to make available implicitly. And they are available for the basic types and for tuples of the basic types. And when you have a case class, it's just one line of code to provide an implicit for your case class. So you can make this work. Well, I naturally have a question. Is it possible to provide these implicits automatically for case classes? Well, it uh, might be possible, yes, with implicit macros or with uh, type materialization. As far as I know, we do not have that yet in Scala 2.10. Is that correct? No, we do. It's in 2.10.2. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, we're at the level of 2.10.1. So. <laughs>
Oh. We should look into that very soon. <laughs> Speaking of looking into something very soon, we want to come out with Slick 2.0 in the third quarter. We're already pretty late now, so I guess it will be September. It won't be earlier than that. But uh, just uh, three days ago, I think, I pushed a new release 2.0.0-M2, the second milestone, to Maven Central and Zonatype. I haven't properly announced that, but if you want to run the code in this presentation and use the new style of table definitions, this is the version you need. So what are we going to do in Slick 2.0? Well, first of all, there's one big feature that is query scheduling. I've already mentioned it. You can write table definitions for different databases. They can be different kinds of databases. So you could have an H2 database and an Oracle database. And then you can write queries that use tables from these different table, from these different databases and use them in a single query. And Slick will split that up automatically into parts that execute on the individual databases. There's a full query interpreter on the client side. So we also have a sort of in-memory database in Slick, which knows how to run all these operations on the client side. And it will join the data there and do everything automatically. Of course, you're giving up a bit of the advantage of Slick for that. It's a trade-off because you might get some inefficient uh, operation done on the client side and have to bring a lot of data there to join it on the client side. So. Uh, yeah, it's a trade-off you have to make. Either you need to write the code on your own and then you can be 100% sure where it executes or you rely on the query scheduling in Slick to do some of that automatically. We've done some improvements to the API that I've just shown you here. We're getting closer and closer to Scala collections. For example, for inserting, you now get the plus equals and plus plus equals methods and you have the new table definitions which uh, I haven't specifically mentioned here, but uh, they require a bit more boilerplate, but they're much more consistent. I would have told you about a couple of caveats otherwise that you're not getting the right, you're getting some strange table nothing type back from your queries in some cases. And you really have to know when to uh, use the uh, lift to a query implicitly and you have to know wh when, when it might accidentally happen. All that is gone now. It's much simpler with the new design. And I've shown you the new driver architecture with the different profiles. This comes along with the new backend architecture, uh, which means you can not only write a JDBC-based backend, you can write a backend for a completely different kind of database. And this is something we'll do we're doing at the moment, it won't be in Slick 2.0 yet, but we hope that in the first quarter of 2014 we'll have MongoDB support in Slick. I know if you've, you've probably seen, or if you've seen my talks before, I promised that for the first quarter of 2013. We didn't quite make it, we didn't have the resources for that that we expected we would, but now we actually do have, so the plan is to have this uh, available within half a year. And we're also going to look into an asynchronous non-blocking API for Slick. Right now, everything is blocking, and this should really not be the case when you want to write a high-performance scalable application. Unfortunately, there's nothing like a non-blocking version of, J of JDBC, so we'll have to do that on our own. There are just some database-specific drivers which are non-blocking, so we will only support a subset of the databases there. But for example, Postgres and MySQL have such APIs for Scala. And there's, of course, a MongoDB API, which is non-blocking. And we're now trying to come up with a proper design for the Slick API to make this work. We also want to have macro-based type providers there. Right now, what we have in Slick 2.0 is the ability to reverse engineer a database schema. So you cannot only write your table definitions in Slick and push them into the database. You can also add a special command to your SPT build to reverse engineer an existing schema and create uh, the code for the Slick table definitions. You can do some custom name mappings and type mappings in there. This is uh, really convenient if you have uh, an existing schema that you're working with. And it also means when somebody else modifies the database schema, then your build will automatically reverse engineer that and you will get a compile error if your database schema no longer matches your code. We wanted to do this with macros. 
I've shown this before as a mock-up in some slides where you can just auto-complete in the IDE on a type which is generated in the compiler from a database schema. We do not have type macros in Scala 2.11. And um, we could do the same with annotation macros. That is actually what we're planning to do because type macros are unlikely to happen. But annotation macros give us pretty much the same power. We were originally planning to have them in 2.10, but we're under time constraints now. You might have heard that Paul Phillips left the Scala group at TypeSafe. He's leaving TypeSafe, so they don't have as much resources now for Scala 2.11. So this might, might show up in 2.11 dot something or probably in Scala 2.12. We have the code ready in a branch that works against Eugene's very advanced macro paradise version of Scala where all the nice macro magic is available. And you can try it out there. And we're hoping to make it uh, available properly in, in a Scala 2.12 build of Slick in the future. And we also want to make Slick the default database library for play. Of course, both are type-safe projects, so we really want to make them work nicely together. There's a Slick Play a plugin that you can use for that, and we want to improve that and make it part of play and of Slick. And so you don't need to have a separate plugin there anymore. Just make it work out of the box. That is pretty much all I have here. So you can follow me on Twitter if you like. And you can check out the code and everything else on our homepage, slick.typesafe.com. I also post the link to the slides there and make them available. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>